Transistor logic is the basis of computing. We've come a long way from vacuum tubes. And what you'll commonly see in more complicated transistor logic, that which is properly computing, such as a CPU, is a clock. And it runs at a regular pace. Your computer or phone or whatever will be rated for a certain clock speed, and you can overclock and all that stuff. But essentially, there is a clock signal, and it just happens at regular intervals. And when the clock signal happens, that's when the logic updates. It doesn't update live. If you change one of the inputs to your logic, it doesn't just magically propagate its way through and give you outputs. It happens on a clock signal, and it may take more than one clock signal for your outputs to be correct for your inputs. But why? Let's look at an abstraction of a basic computing device. You might have a CPU, you might have memory, and you might have I.O. So your CPU is what does the thinking, memory is what does the storing, and I.O. communicates with physical devices, such as a keyboard and mouse, that might be inputs, or speakers, or your monitor, that would be outputs. Your monitor might read from memory where it has video RAM. Your speakers might be driven by the CPU directly, or have a buffer and RAM, all kinds of different stuff. Let's not worry about the details. But basically, each of these is going to be transistor logic. Your CPU is going to have inputs and outputs. The inputs might be from I.O., the inputs might be from memory. And then your memory also has inputs and outputs. The input might be from the CPU as the result of a calculation. It might be from the I.O. where maybe the microphone is writing into memory for the CPU to process later. And of course, obviously, the I.O. has inputs and outputs. And the transistors in the I.O are, you know, just translating in and out, whereas the CPU transistors are calculating and the memory transistors are like flip-flops, as well as address translation and all this stuff. But each of these things can just be thought of as a mass of transistors, and a lot of them. Think about how big a nice Intel or AMD CPU is. You know, Intel might be this big, AMD nowadays are pretty doggone big, but their transistors are only nanometers in size. Nanometers. That's a lot of transistors. So let's say you have inputs to a CPU, and you might have, let's just use a mental image here, where some of the pins of the CPU are saying, I want you to execute an instruction. And the CPU knows what part of memory to fetch the instruction. So the CPU basically has wires going to the memory. The CPU says, I want an instruction from memory. So it sets its pins going to memory to a certain address to say, okay, memory, give me whatever's at this address. And the memory would have pins going back to the CPU to give it that value. But none of this is instantaneous. We're limited by the speed of light, which is, as far as we know, the universal speed limit. Let's not get into quantum entanglement. Just don't go there. But even gravity is limited by the speed of light. When you apply electric charges to a wire to create a voltage, an electric field propagates around the circuit. That electric field is slower than the speed of light. It's close to the speed of light, but not quite. So we're already slowing down. But then the actual electricity is electrons moving in aggregate now, because the electrons go like this, but they move to one side. They have mass, which means they go much, 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 much slower than light. So on a human time scale, it's still fractions of fractions of fractions of blinks of eyes. But on a physical time scale, it's pretty doggone slow. So every time you need to change how electricity is flowing, such as through transistors, there is a delay. It's a short one, but there's a delay. So the CPU has to set its pins output to be whatever address to get from memory. The memory can't be giving the CPU that address's contents at the same time, because it doesn't know the address yet, at least in a simple CPU. You know, modern CPUs have fancy prefetch nonsense, but in a basic level, the CPU has to tell the memory what to give it before it can give it. So the CPU sets the outputs, and then the memory's like, oh, you want this, okay. But the CPU can't be acting on that value until the memory gives it to it. So there's discrete steps here. The CPU has to inform the memory, the memory's gotta wait. And then the CPU has to wait while the memory gives a thing. And that's that process of set an output, wait, set an output, wait, is replicated throughout the system. And this is where the clock signal comes in. Here's another abstraction. Let's say you have inputs 
to some transistor logic. Don't worry about what the logic is. There's just logic. And let's say it's got several layers. And here's your outputs. Because you're unlikely to be able to do a fancy computation with just gates, where you just say, okay, set the inputs, get the outputs of the gates. So inside here, you're going to have connections between layers, whatever this logic is. So you've got your inputs here. So you set your inputs, and then you've got a bunch of transistors in here. And those transistors have to respond to those inputs, which is not instantaneous. So they change, and their outputs eventually settle down. And there they are, connected to the inputs of the next layer. But the next layer can't be doing anything, correctly at least, until this layer has settled down and given its proper outputs. So this layer has to wait for this layer, but then this layer has to wait for this layer, and then your outputs have to wait for this layer. So you might say, okay, you set the inputs and you give it a pulse, such as a clock signal. You say, boom. So that starts these, then you know about how long it's going to take, right? You, 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 based on how your circuit works, how many transistors you have, how deep they are, you know about how much time you have to wait to be sure everything's ready. And you give it another signal. Boom, boom, boom. So each clock signal would advance this logic down the line one layer at a time. But why, you say? Why don't you just set the inputs and then you know about how long this whole thing is going to take, right? So why even a clock signal? You just set the inputs and you know how, about how long to wait until the outputs are safe to read. Think about the flip-flop, right? Think about the latch even, just a simple SR latch. The point of the SR latch is to preserve a value. If you give it a set signal, the latch turns on. If you give it a reset signal, the latch turns off. If you give it the invalid signal, then it's goofed up, and you have to give it a set of reset to fix it. And then if you don't give it any signal, it keeps whatever value it was. That's the point of the latch, such as RAM. RAM doesn't use SR latches, but it uses flip-flops, which are just a little more advanced, but it's the same concept. It's the same thing, just with more transistors. Or if it's DRAM, it uses capacitors as well. That's a little tricky trick they use. But the point is, let's say you have a flip-flop in here. Let's say you have one of the SR latches. Let's say you've got a latch in here, and right now the latch is at a certain value and you want it to stay there. Whatever you're doing, you don't need to change that latch. So this layer doing its computation is not going to give a signal to the latch that's part of layer two. So layer three will keep getting the output of the latch that was already there. So how about as the electric fields are settling, as the electricity is moving around, the transistors are turning on and off. What if it just so happens that in the transition, one of them's a little faster than the other and blah, 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 and this latch accidentally gets an invalid signal or even just a signal. Whereas once it settles, it's not giving the latch a signal. But in the process of changing all these complex transistors, one of the outputs is accidentally giving the latch a signal that messes up the latch, even though the final value is not going to mess up the latch. That's the problem here. If we don't lock off a layer by layer by layer, then anything that has a state, if this was all just a mass of gates with no feedback, no memory whatsoever, we could just set an input and wait until the output is right. There'd be nothing stopping us from doing that. But Modern computing, complex logic, is going to have latches all over the place. It's going to have registers. It's going to have I.O. pins. It's going to have signals like CPUs nowadays, well, from since before I was born, I guess, have a concept of an interrupt, usually from an I.O. pin such as the keyboard, where you press a key in a keyboard and that gets processed by the little keyboard circuit. And the keyboard is connected to the CPU with a little line, with a wire. And that might go, let's say it goes low. And when it goes low, the CPU is alerted to say, the keyboard wants to talk to me. So if the CPU is busy, the keyboard will wait. As soon as the CPU has a second, it's going to talk to the keyboard. It'll trigger something called an interrupt service routine. But the point is, a CPU is not going to be, a system is not going to be just inputs, pff, outputs, and you just wait each time you change the inputs. There's all kinds of state in there. And if it goes wrong, then your system is just going to crash into a bunch of gobbledygook. Some of you might not be familiar with what overclocking a CPU means on a computer. It's basically just setting how fast the clock is, right? So internally, the CPU is a bunch of transistors and there's layers. And in the CPU, it's got the clock signal and they've wired it up. Whoever made the CPU wired it up and has the clock signal going through all these layers however it needs to. So every time you pulse it, it'll work. But you have to 
make sure that the clock signal is long enough so that the slowest part of the circuit of the CPU can finish. And your manufacturer is going to set the base clock speed. The clock speed that the CPU comes with out of the box is going to be a speed that the manufacturer says, okay, everything is going to be fine. Everything will be done every time with this clock speed. The process of overclocking, if you're trying to build a fancy gaming computer, is you make it faster. And if you make it faster, sometimes you're fine. But sometimes you make it just fast enough that something inside doesn't finish in time. You get bad stuff, you get bad results, and it crashes your computer. So that's what overclocking is. You just go to the hard limit because the manufacturer is going to set a safe limit. But it's just this. It's just transistors inside that have to finish up what they're doing. And you overclock it until the point that they stop being able to finish what they're doing. Now, not to get into a whole overclocking thing, but if you increase the voltage going to your CPU, it actually makes things faster. More voltage means transistors operate faster. Uh, that's a, you know, very simple way to put it, but in essence, more voltage means it settles faster. So you can turn up the voltage and then turn up the clock speed because it will have settled faster, but then it generates more heat. And so you set your CPU on fire. <laughs> so that's the process of overclocking. Turn up the voltage, turn up the speed, turn up the voltage, turn up the speed until it's about to catch fire and then stop. But this is in essence what's going on. So you have a concept of a latch and a flip-flop. I mentioned that the difference between a latch and a flip-flop is whether or not it has a clock signal. So let's say you have your SR, S, R, Q, and not Q. This is kind of how they get drawn, is a box with the inputs and outputs. So this is just an SR latch. So if you give bad values, and of course it's actually going to be S naught and R naught, but you know what I mean. If you give bad values, it's going to screw it up. But what you can have is your S naught R naught and that little symbol, and we could say CLK, and then here's your Q and your not Q, and it's five pins. And I'll obviously go over what this is later, but now it's just an extra pin with a clock. So what happens is when the clock is not giving a signal, right? Because the clock is do it, stop, do it, stop, do it, stop on a regular interval. When clock is in stop mode, it doesn't matter what you put in for S and R, the latch is going to ignore it, which in this case, the flip-flop is going to ignore it. You can wiggle those inputs all you want, but until the clock says it's time to do something, the flip-flop is not going to do anything. And then when the clock goes, okay, now, and you've timed it so that whatever's feeding this flip-flop is ready, it's settled, right? Just however long it takes, we say, okay, based on this voltage, this whatever, the outputs are correct. Then you give it a clock pulse and it'll say, okay, now I will take the inputs. And then the clock stops saying that and it goes back to ignoring and it goes tick, 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 tick. So that's the basic principle is you have to wait for pieces of logic to be done so that they can feed the next piece of logic because there's multiple layers. If one nanosecond is one billionth of a second. That means there are one billion nanoseconds in a second. A billion. So that means you can do one billion, if you have something that takes one nanosecond to do, you can do that a billion times in a single second. That's a lot. That's operating at a frequency of a gigahertz. Oh wait, as soon as I say gigahertz, you may recognize that word. My CPU on my computer runs at 3.9 gigahertz. So that's already 3.9 times as fast as our hypothetical one single nanosecond operation. And my CPU is considered slow because my CPU is rated for doing multiple things at a time. It's got 16 CPUs inside it, little mini CPUs. So 3.9 gigahertz is slow, but it's doing 16 of those at a time. So parallel. A gaming PC is rated for speed. You get a good quality gaming PC, you're going at a 5 gigahertz rate or even a smidgen more. So that's 5 or even more than 5 times as fast as our one nanosecond operation. Nanoseconds to a human, we can't conceive of it. We cannot conceive of a nanosecond. It's so small. But to a computer, it's ages. Let's take a look. I have here my power supply, five volts, and I'm just giving it some current. It's not gonna draw much. And I'm using the wave generator here, which is a one kilohertz square wave from zero to five volts. So basically a five volt signal off, on, off, on, off, on. And here I just have three inverters, three NOT gates with NPN transistors. So first, let me show you the signal itself. 
So the signal that's going through none of these gates is just a nice square wave. Here, let me zoom in. Going through none of the signals, we just have a nice square wave from zero to five volts. But if I plug in the other one, that's going through two of them, right? Just one after the other, oop, one after the other after the other. So since each one's an inverter, after two of them, the signal's back to normal because it goes negative, positive, negative. So after the second gate, we get something like this. Looks pretty normal, right? If I put them on top of each other, it's basically right on top of each other. But let me just zoom in a little bit. Let me zoom in time, zoom in time, zoom in time, and suddenly you can see there's a delay here. There's a bit of a delay. The yellow signal is before any gates. That's no gates. The green signal is two gates. And you can see over here, you know, they're perfectly fine and before they're perfectly fine on top of each other. But when one changes, there's a delay. Now you may say, that's weird. Why does it go down and then up? Because this is after two gates. The first gate is bringing it down. The second gate is bringing it up. So the yellow gate is just, or the yellow, the yellow signal, the original signal is just going up. This is the original square wave. And then it goes through one gate and then two gates. And you can see there's a delay. How much delay? Well, let me put the split point on one of these little dividers. The dividers are 100 nanoseconds. So they join up about one, two, three, four blocks. 400 nanoseconds. Again, on a human time scale, that's nothing. If you're just using transistors to make a little blinky light, this is completely ignorable. And these are just regular 2N3904 that you can get for a dime for a billion. And there are definitely much higher quality, higher frequency transistors that will switch much faster. But the point is, 400 nanoseconds. We've already established one nanosecond is ages. 400 of them just for two layers. This is the propagation delay. So let's look at three gates. So let me take these signals back out. Now, after there's three gates total, after one gate, the signal has been inverted. After three gates, the inverted signal is back to normal and inverted again. So let's compare one and three gates. So this will be after the first inverter, and this will be after the third. And we have something pretty similar, don't we? And you can see it's a little more, you know, loose. But the point is we get the same thing where it's going down and then up. Let me auto scale, make sure it's a little easier to see. And again, if we zoom out, you know, there's a difference in the voltage because of the way I have it hooked up, but the frequencies are the same. Let's zoom in. And now we can see most definitely that delay. So let me leave it about here. And let's say, let's just say there. Let's say about here is where they diverge. Let me wiggle it over a little more. They're pretty close there. Let's say that's when the signal starts changing. And then let's say that this is where it settles down, where the green one settles down, because obviously the yellow settles down a lot sooner, but the green settles down there. The difference, the, the dividers are 500 nanoseconds. So about one, two, three, three or four, we are almost to two entire microseconds now, just because so much is going on, so much delay. And again, the signals do eventually settle. After a couple microseconds, the voltages are different, but we're still getting our highs and lows, which is going to make it work fine. Let's go over to the, the down instead of the up. Let's take a look at that. And now it's a little easier to see over here where the signal after one gate has already dropped and the signal after two gates, or actually after three gates, so this is after one gate, the signal after three gates eventually drops later on and gets pretty close. And there's no wiggle this time, just again, because of the way it's hooked up. So we don't see the down and then up or up and then down, but we still see that delay. So from here, 100 nanoseconds, one, two, three, let's say four. So it's not even the same delay. It's not even the same delay. It's the same components. It's just the other side of the square. And we don't even have the same delay. This is why overclocking a computer is a tricky business. This is why clock signals, reliable clock signals, are vital for transistor logic in anything more complicated than blinking Christmas lights. This is why CPUs and other devices are rated by calculations per second, clocks per second, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz. This is why you have communication wires like Ethernet rated in bits per second. You know, gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet, 10 billion bits per second. When we're when I was doing the oscilloscope on the Arduino, connecting it to the USB port and the serial communication at a certain baud rate, bits per second, because it takes time to settle. It takes time to communicate. It's not just about how fast the data can be generated. It's about how long it takes for one bit 
to go from high to low and you don't catch it in between. So I suppose this was more of a floofy video where I just decided to ramble about whatever I wanted to talk about. But I hope you found at least some interest in it. Maybe if you had no idea how computer overclocking worked, or even if you do but you never knew why, you just knew how to do it but not really why you had to do it that way. That's why. So now we'll actually get into turning latches into these nice safe flip-flops and more advanced flip-flops and circuits that use them. Until then, I'll be seeing you.